Hey guys, it's Godbars here, the self-proclaimed hip-hop historian, and this is the 186th episode of my series, where I grab a vinyl from my collection, talk about why I love it, what influence it has, and what its place is in the grand scheme of hip-hop. So while I've already featured Jay-Z on the channel multiple times in the past, today we're covering his most recent full-length studio album, the Grammy-nominated 444 from 2017. If I remember correctly, this title was inspired by Hove waking up and seeing that time on his alarm clock, or something like that, which I remember a lot of people saying they didn't believe and it was obviously fake and he made that up. But honestly, I think it would be kind of a weird and innocuous thing to lie about. I mean, to my knowledge, 444 isn't something that had a deep inherent meaning prior to this to Jay. And there's only so many numbers out there. I don't think it's really that crazy that he woke up and saw 444 on his alarm clock. Regardless, that isn't especially relevant to the actual musical experience itself, outside of it being the name of the stellar title track. What really made this album one of the most talked about of the decade was the reputation it rightfully earned as one of, if not the most mature LP, any rapper of this status has dropped. I remember a lot of people labeling it as a grown man album back when it was first hitting the public. The music itself reflects this, but there's really no aspect that displays this mature attitude more than the content, which is pretty deeply rooted and intertwined with Hove's personal life. Even outside of his relationship issues, it had been a number of projects since Jay had really impressed and won over the non-believers which led to both fans and critics alike accusing him of losing touch. Of course, rapping about both the streets and the high life was no new subject for him, but with certain albums like Watch the Throne, many felt like he wasn't using his skill as a master lyricist to its full potential. But with this release, he'd pretty much already blown that expectation out of the way with the singles before the full length even dropped, especially the monumental track The Story of OJ, which was given a giant boost by the killer music video that accompanied it. The animation alone is just genius and assists Jay in the hard-hitting topics he's cycling through on this song, like institutional and historical racism, poverty and wealth, and the idea that no matter how high your level of fame and success is, you're still part of the same community as that young savage who's hustling on the street corner. But there is also a distinct trace of dark or black comedy on the story of OJ. And I think there's a bit more going on here than just being proud of your roots and having that piece of ghetto in you even after you've left that place of origin. It's an indictment on how so many bitter people of any race will find every excuse in the book to tear down a successful African-American man with more money, artistic integrity, and business savvy than they have. However, a key puzzle piece to this track in 444 as a whole is the constant introspection that Jay brings, really tearing up a number of barriers that hadn't been broken down before. For example, personally, prior to this release, I really didn't know about Jay-Z's mother being a lesbian, which isn't inherently some crazy bombshell, unless you're a bigot who pushes the narrative of gay people not having the ability to parent. But what does make this little tidbit relevant to the album's grand statements is Jay disclosing all the ignorance and pressure that resulted in his mom spending most of her life in the closet. And he expresses how he just wants her to be happy regardless of who she loves, which you would hope and assume wouldn't be a controversial take. But sadly, this genre and society in general still has a lot of progress to make. He tackles many situations head-on that people had speculated on over the years, like the Solange elevator situation, or stabbing Lance Riviera, aka Un, at Q-Tip's Amplified album release party, way back in 1999, and even his feelings of betrayal when it came to Kanye. Many of these topics get addressed on the opening track, Kill Jay-Z, which sees him disassembling his own ego before the project even gets going. As if to say, alright, everyone keeps asking me to spit some real shit, so I'll give you that and then some. I remember an amount of listeners and even big names like Future getting extremely heated and defensive over Hove's one line on this LP where he spits something about rappers online holding money to their ear and how there's a disconnect, we don't call that real money over here. 
I remember people trying to make this seem like Jay was looking down on the rappers who flex, and they would say it's hypocritical considering the type of stunting Jay used to do, like in the music video for Big Pimpin' with UGK. The thing is, you're kind of missing the point if you boil it down to that, because the message is that the top dogs with the real money are investing and building their own empires, but some naive 13-year-old may genuinely think that Future is wealthier than Jay-Z because Hove isn't posting pictures of his money on Instagram. There's dozens and dozens of current events of the time that Jay uses as a stepping stool to help stay fresh and relevant while never actually stepping into trendy territory, which was the issue for most of us when it had come to some of his previous albums. But with 444, the production is absolutely timeless, and it hasn't aged a day even if you throw that project on right now. And it really speaks to his relevancy when you realize an album like Culture by Migos that dropped the same year really hasn't aged all that well because they were playing so hard to the radio. Of course that isn't inherently bad or anything, it just might explain why someone who came in the game 20 years before those dudes is able to stay more consistent and ultimately more relevant in the scheme of things. But even with every single track being studded with lyrical gems and food for thought, for me the title track track is in a league of its own, especially when it comes to its emotional vulnerability and honesty. While it gets touched on numerous times throughout 444 and even on Beyonce's Lemonade album that same year, Jay pens an apology that could make a statue tear up. I mean, if you haven't heard any of the songs from this album, I implore you to at least give this one track a listen. The beat gives me chills to this day, and that alone could have carried this track. But then Jay crafted some of the most flawless verses to touch the 2010s just for this instrumental, allowing it to become what's in my opinion a genuine masterpiece. There are so many lines where Hove is just bearing his heart to the audience, but the genius thing is it's really more of a direct letter to his wife that he was unfaithful to, and it almost comes off like we're overhearing this extremely private and gut-wrenching conversation. This song is fittingly exactly 4 minutes and 44 seconds with zero filler, which results in so many memorable and quote-worthy bars. And most importantly, it shows how hip-hop doesn't always have to promote cheating or bragging about your bad treatment of women a la future. And it's the type of thing I think someone like Kanye just doesn't have the lack of ego to do. Him and a good amount of other artists would rather be labeled as a free thinker for spreading hate speech, but when it comes time to actually be a man, pull up your pants, and apologize, they're nowhere to be found. I think this is exactly why Jay has had such a long and fruitful marriage with the dream girl of millions, because he treats her like a queen who's equal to him and not some prop that he can dress the way he sees fit like an American doll. Either way, I have to share a handful of my favorite lines from the title track, starting with the very first ones that open up the song, where he gets straight to the point with, Look, I apologize, often womanize, took for my child to be born, see through a woman's eyes, took for these natural twins to believe in miracles, took me too long for this song, I don't deserve you. Another killer set of bars comes soon after those first ones, with Hove saying, I apologize, I seen the innocence leave your eyes, I still mourn its death, and I apologize for all the stillborns, cause I wasn't present, your body wouldn't accept it. I apologize to all the women whom I toyed with your emotions cause I was emotionless, and I apologize cause at your best, you are love. And because I fall short of what I say I'm all about, your eyes leave with the soul that your body once housed. And you stare blankly into space, thinking of all the time you wasted it on all this basic shit. So I apologize. I could really break down this song all day, but the last section I want to share has to be when he says, I apologize, our love was one for the ages, and I contained us, and all this ratchet shit, and we more expansive, not meant to cry and die alone in these mansions, or sleep with our back turned. We supposed to vacate till our backs burn. We're supposed to laugh till our hearts stop, and then meet in a place where the dark stop. And let love light the way. Like the men before me, I cut off my nose to spite my face. 
I never wanted another woman to know something about me that you didn't know. I promise I cried I couldn't hold. I could keep going and delve into the lines about how ashamed he would be if he was confronted by his children about this situation in the future, and how he wouldn't be able to look them in the eye, but I think you probably get the point by now. While there's a couple big names like James Blake who assist with production on a couple of the bonus tracks, when it comes to the main 10 songs that you'll find on streaming services, they're all completely handled by the legendary No ID. His immaculate chops and cuts give you that classic, old-school Rockefeller feel, just with a more modern twist. Another aspect of this LP that kept it fresh upon release were the high-profile features that may be few and far between, but they pack a punch with names like Beyonce, Damian Marley, Frank Ocean, Jay's mom, Gloria Carter, and we even get a guest appearance by a young Blue Ivy Carter on one of the bonus tracks. For my three favorites on this one, it really wasn't much of a competition, as the songs I adore the most on here are without a doubt 444, Kill Jay-Z, and The Story of OJ. When it comes to honorable mentions, I'd have to narrow it down to Smile, Family Feud, Bam, Marcy Me, and Legacy. Thank you for watching my 186th video. Next time we're doing one of modern hip-hop's most enigmatic personalities. So tune in for that one. And if you enjoyed, be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know what your favorite songs off of this big boy album are. Don't forget to have a great day, and I'll see you next time, okay? Okay. Boop, boop, boop. such a thing but look i stand in the flame of a feeling we call pain father's day mug little hand shaped the clay carrier planes flew overhead in pockets